Hi everybody, um, I'm James Guzman and uh, this is the first in a series of videos that I'll be doing for Borderless Blog. Um, just basically talking to people about traveling, investing, and living beyond borders. I uh, hope you enjoy them. We should have some interesting people coming on and uh, talking about their experiences from all over the world. Uh, today I have a friend of mine, Ash Whitener, who works for Euro Pacific Bank and is currently living in Panama City. Uh, he's originally from the United States, so uh, just kind of wanted to talk to him a little bit about uh, what made him want to move out there and also uh, a little bit about the, uh, the bank that he, that, uh, he works for. So uh, how you doing, Ash? Good. Hey, James. How are you? If you wouldn't mind, if you could just tell people a little bit about uh, your background and, and what made you want to move to Panama City. Sure. I mean, my background, I'm originally from uh, North Carolina in the United States. And my background, educational-wise, is in engineering. I have uh, two bachelor's degrees in computer and electrical engineering. And, you know, I started working in the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. And um, in my free time, I was learning about freedom and learning about liberty and all the things that are associated with learning that. You know, it comes economics, you know, freedom of money, freedom of choice, freedom to, to live how you want. And I started to understand that, you know, most things in life requires the freedom of money, and I just became in very intrigued by it. And I started, you know, reading Ron Paul's works and Murray Rothbard's works, and you know, ultimately, I started listening to uh, Peter Schiff, who I currently work for, and listening to his video blog every day for a while. And uh, one day on his radio show, he decided uh, to to let us know that he he broadcast on his show that he was looking for people to come and work for an offshore and international bank, Euro Pacific Bank. And so I submitted my resume and a couple articles that I had written over the years on my blog. And I got a call. And I think that's about the same time you and I met each other, James. Uh, you, you were in the same scenario. We, we met down in Charleston and interviewed with Peter. And we, you know, a month or two later, we moved down to the Caribbean to uh, start this craziness. <laughs> yeah, and I, rem I, remember, I remember the day that we met in Charleston. And uh, we both had to meet with uh, Peter Schiff, who'd, who we'd followed a lot of his videos, a lot of uh, his books and writings and things like that. And we were really, uh, really excited when that day came. We were actually able to sit down and we got the job. So that was, that was something else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we lived in, we lived in the Caribbean for a while and then you moved to Mexico and I decided I wanted to move to, to Panama. And, you know, it's been a really great experience so far. And there's a, there's a lot of different reasons why I chose to move to Panama. It's, um, they use the U.S. dollar as their base currency. Um, it's also, the, the government's pretty friendly to, to tourists and to Americans with their visas. It's a very high quality of life here and just overall a really good experience so far. I've, oh. been, I've lived in Panama for about a year and a half now. It, it seems like uh, your decision to move to Panama was kind of secondary from your uh, decision to move out of the United States. Uh, is that right? I mean, you just wanted to move somewhere and you chose Panama, right? That's right. That's right. You know, I, the more I learned about freedom and Austrian economics and just what money really is, that it's not these little paper certificates that governments print up and put faces on them or scribblings on them, the more I learned about money, it became very obvious to me that the U.S. dollar was in some serious trouble. And uh, just looking through history and the ramifications that come with when a currency starts to collapse, like we saw, for instance, in the Weimar Republic or in Argentina several times, um, that that wasn't really a scenario that I wanted to, to be in. And I didn't want to be on the, sh the proverbial ship as it was sinking. And so I knew, you know, several years ago that I wanted to get out of the United States. I didn't necessarily know where. Um, and Panama seemed like a very obvious and a very friendly choice for me. Okay, so it was mostly uh, economic reasons uh, that, you, that you didn't want to stay in the United States. A lot of it had to do with economic reasons and, and the totalitarian nature of governments that comes along with economic troubles. You know, when the, f the money is starting to lose value, then the, the tightening has to, has to follow to try to keep the party going, you know, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be around while that trouble started. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, so there in Panama, do you f how, uh, what, what kind of uh, differences do you find in life as compared to uh, being in Raleigh? Yeah, I, I would say that 
there's a lot of similarities, firstly. You know, there's skyscrapers more so than in Raleigh. There's large malls and fine restaurants. Um, I find the differences, though, are subtle, yet, you know, you, you'll definitely notice them the longer you're here, of course. Um, I personally think the traffic patterns are, are much better here. People know how to drive a lot better. Um, you know, it's more free-flowing and everything isn't uh, very concrete. I find that the people are very friendly, even to someone like myself who speaks only a, a small amount of Spanish. Um, you know, just common courtesies are all over the place. Um, there, things are things are just very nice here. I mean, you know, you're going to pay a little bit more for electricity at times, but I mean, overall, it's a very pleasant experience. Food is cheap and and very plentiful and fresh in the supermarkets, and it's just a very high standard of living, which is is very nice, especially seeing that we came from Barbados and Saint Vincent, where you know things were very expensive and they were inconvenient. Here, there's taxi cabs everywhere. You'll never wait longer than, you know, a couple minutes to catch a cab to go anywhere in the city. And they're very affordable. I can go anywhere in Panama City for about five U.S. Oh, nice. Yeah, over here where I'm living, uh, by the way, I'm in uh, San Miguel de Allende. It's in uh, central Mexico. And uh, here, they, the, you can normally get a cab anywhere in the city for uh, 35, 40 pesos, which comes out to be about three bucks. So, you know, that, that's definitely a plus with living in Latin America is, uh, is uh, you know, transportation and things like that. Um, so are there a lot of places, um, you know, things to do? Do you, I mean, uh, have you found people to, local people to be friendly to you? Have you, uh, have there been, have you had any difficulties in that, in that uh, regard? Right. Well, seeing that I don't speak a lot of Spanish, which is something I'm obviously working on, uh, it was difficult for the first few months to try to meet people. But slowly and surely, I started to meet both Spanish people as well as Americans. Uh, and now I have a great group of friends in, here in Panama, both Latin friends and, and American gringo friends, that are philosophically aligned with the freedom movement and with gold and Bitcoin and you know just everything that we're trying to do to build a better world and a freer world and so you know it's it the the last year or so has been really great because there are a lot of people in Panama and you know, there's over a million people in the city of Panama and there is a fairly strong libertarian uh, bent here if you know the right people and you start getting into some of these circles um, and they're a blast to hang out with you know I can have conversations with my friends in Panama just like I could have conversations in the old Ron Paul meetup groups back in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you, I didn't really expect that here. You don't really know what people think about their government necessarily until you come in a place and you start living here and organizing yourself in, in the city. And there's a lot of libertarian type of thought here, uh, which, is, which was a very pleasant surprise, as you can imagine. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I know uh, just from the uh, corruption index that's put out, um, Panama is uh, up near the near the top of that. Uh, how do you take that? Uh, do, you, do you find there's a lot of corruption, or uh, does that harm you in any way? You know, the only corruption that is obvious is, of course, the government corruption, uh, because it's always easy to spend. Uh, recklessly when you have other people's money. For instance, you know, the Metro in Panama has made international news because it was supposed to cost something like 80 million and end up costing like over 200 million dollars. And, um, you know, so you know that there is, I mean, we have government here in Panama, so you know that it's corrupt by definition, right? Um, and, but the people in general have been very polite and very pleasing. I haven't seen any danger. I mean, I've lived here literally for a year and a half. I haven't seen one mugging. I haven't seen any trouble. You know, I've only seen a couple car wrecks. And, you know, you walk in as a non-Spanish speaking person into a restaurant or a cafe or somewhere. And, you know, most of the times nobody's going to speak a lot of English. But, you know, they're very accommodating, like the little bit of English that they speak and, and the little bit of Spanish that I speak, they're very welcoming. And, you know, it's, it's the beautiful thing about money is that I don't necessarily have to communicate with you through words very much because the communication of the free market and of money 
and of prices help coordinate my interactions with people in Panama, even though there is a language barrier. But overall, it's it's just a really great experience. Yeah, that, that's funny you say that because uh, you know I, I think one of the biggest drawbacks for uh, um, Americans or Canadians uh, to go to Latin America is they think that it's this dangerous hellhole or something. And uh, it sounds like there is comparable to here. Here uh, in San Miguel, I would say is uh, <clears throat> less, uh, is more safe than uh, any United States uh, city I could uh, think of. Um, just very safe. I never have any um, uh, problems with that. So um, now let's talk a little bit about uh, Europe Pacific Bank. Um, now I know that the a major seller for you guys is the uh, gold card. Uh, can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, so basically, uh, if any of your listeners are familiar with Peter Schiff, then you know that we believe in sound, honest money. And so whenever forming the bank, uh, we decided to create not only a 100% reserve bank, meaning that we do not extend credit, you know, we do not make loans with any of our clients' funds, and they sit as cash balances on deposit. But we also wanted to give our clients a way to opt out of the government money entirely. And to do that, we offer physical gold and physical silver bank accounts that the metal is stored at the Perth Mint in Australia. Um, you know, so what our clients can do is they can store their wealth in uh, an array of currencies, the dollar, the euro, the, you know, the, the Swiss franc, the Canadian dollar, the pound, the Aussie dollar, etc. But if that's not enough, if that's not enough safety for our clients, they can store their wealth in gold and silver. Well, you know, one of the main issues or one of the main criticisms to gold and silver is that you can't spend it very easily. And that is very true. I mean, James, if I wanted to, to pay you for some web design service that you could do for me, you're in Mexico, I'm in Panama, how am I going to possibly send you, you know, a gold coin in the mail? Well, first, it's probably going to get confiscated by one of our governments because governments aren't very friendly on gold for various reasons. But so what we've done is we professionally store the gold and silver for our clients and we have a MasterCard debit card that at any time they can sell a portion of their, their gold holdings or their stash and use those proceeds to directly fund up a debit card and then go out and spend, you know, that that wealth anywhere MasterCard is accepted. You know, a million merchants worldwide, right? And so I could go online and I could use it. I could go to your online store and I could purchase your products using this debit card. And whereas I wouldn't be able to do the same with say physical gold or silver. So you know we we still highly recommend that everybody has some physical gold and silver on them where they store on their person or you know at, at their house or buried in their backyard or in a safe or somewhere where they can get to it in case you know the the dollar does start to collapse or or lose you know a lot of value but for those people that feel that they have a comfortable amount of precious metals stored on them and they want another alternative i think that the gold and silver bank accounts at your pacific bank are a great alternative as long as you're not a united states uh, citizen or resident of course right yeah that's another thing that we should go over um, your pacific bank does not accept uh, united states citizens uh, would you mind uh, explaining that to people yeah, well, ba basically, when you start accepting U.S. clients, there's a whole additional set of regulations that you need to abide by and fill out. And, you know, you have to have uh, people that are able to communicate with the government and fill out all the random forms. And it's just a lot of red tape that I'm sure if any of your, if any of your listeners are familiar with Peter, he spoke on his radio show many times that, you know, he has a compliance department in some of his brokerage uh, offices that's larger than his sales department because there's just so much unnecessary red tape, of course, for the protection of the, uh, of the investor, right, um, that he has to go through, that it makes creating a small business very difficult. And so without accepting U.S. clients, we remove a lot of that, uh, what we consider unnecessary regulation and red tape. And it also helps protect the privacy and the safety of our, our non-U.S. clients. Yeah, and uh, this is actually is, is a bit of a problem already. And uh, if people aren't aware, there's a uh, law coming into effect uh, in the next few months called FACTA, which uh, greatly affects Americans uh, that want to uh, 
invest or uh, put their money uh, in other countries around the world. Uh, it does not only affect uh, U.S. citizens, but also U.S. persons. Uh, and the definition of a U.S. person is very ambiguous and uh, ever-growing. So if people are not aware of that, uh, I would uh, definitely look into that if you're thinking about opening a bank account or, or any type of investment uh, overseas. So uh, what, what, do you, what do you recommend people uh, that are thinking maybe they don't have any gold or they're just barely in gold? What would you recommend as a good you know, allocation or what are some of the reasons that someone would want to uh, have a portion of their savings in gold? Right. Well, it always first starts with the education and you need to know why you're buying gold and silver before you jump in and start buying it. You know, a lot of people see gold and silver, you know, especially a couple of years ago when silver went from, you know, just a couple dollars up to $50 and a lot of guys were jumping on the bandwagon for the wrong reasons. These were, uh, you know, people that weren't in the market to secure wealth with the precious metals, but were looking to flip it for a quick buck. And, you know, I, I don't recommend that. I mean, I, I am a trader. I am a technical trader as well, and I understand that when a market's moving, people want to jump in. But as a, for a fundamental, you know, wealth preservation and capital preservation, you know, gold and silver has historically done a really good job. It's been money for five thousand years. So what I recommend is, you know, read read Murray Rothbard's book what has government done to our money and then that will give you a solid understanding it's only you know 60 pages it'll give you a solid understanding of what money actually is and then you'll be able to use that knowledge to understand why gold and silver is money and why it will help protect your wealth you know when these fiat monies which they will inevitably do they will collapse uh, and and become worthless so you know if if you don't have any gold or silver in your portfolio i highly recommend that you you know just spend an afternoon or spend spend an hour or two online and look at why gold and silver have historically been money and then you know go to if you're an american citizen you know go to somewhere like kitco or some some reputable place to buy gold and silver if you're not a us citizen or resident of course you can contact the bank europacbank.com or myself directly ash at europacbank.com and i'll be glad to chat with you or have one of my guys chat with you about what what it means like look at your portfolio and see if there's a place for either some additional gold or silver in your in your portfolio or perhaps you know your first couple of ounces and get you introduced to what real honest money is um, that's it, it's it really comes down to what is money and what are you trying to do if you're looking to protect wealth then you know I think that gold and silver definitely plays a role in that for you yeah uh, another good resource for those that um, uh, are not familiar with with gold and, and the track record it's had and and some of the reasons that you might want to buy gold um, Mike Maloney has a lot of good videos uh, on that as well, if you're just getting educated in this type of thing. Uh, another reason that I would say uh, Europe Pacific Bank is a good place to put your money is uh, it's based in St. Vincent, which seems to have pretty good um, uh, protection of your uh, of the details of your bank account, this type of thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, it's, and like you mentioned before, it's not a uh, fractional reserve bank, so it gives you another layer of protection in several other ways. So, um, you know, I, I think that I think it's that's that's the right approach. What you said, as far as just having some physical on you, uh, the, you know, that you can get to in a in a point that you know gold goes to ten thousand dollars. That's not going to be a a time where you want to go running around trying to cash in gold, you know, paper gold in the other side of the world and this type of thing. But uh, if once you have that as kind of your um, insurance your your financial insurance then you can kind of uh, keep diversifying your gold holdings and uh, I think that Europe Pacific Bank is a good way to do that so for those that are might be interested in contacting uh, Europe Pacific Bank might be interested in talking to Ash or some other people there at the bank uh, would you mind giving out your uh, website and email again sure yeah the website is um, www.euro e u r o pack p a c bank B-A-N-K dot com, EuropacBank.com. And any of your listeners can reach me by Ash, A-S-H-E, at EuropacBank.com. I highly recommend that, uh, you know, 
the listeners go to the website. There's a lot of a wealth of information out there. Uh, we've spent a lot of good time in trying to, you know, put ourselves out there as very transparent because we want everybody to understand exactly what we're doing. Because we do feel that we are we exist to try to help people preserve wealth, and you know, we do that in mul- many different ways um, with the with the gold and silver bank accounts, the multi currencies, you know, the hundred percent reserve banking. But there's a lot of products that we offer, uh, direct access to over 20 global exchanges on our brokerage platform, and of course, Peter Schiff's uh, managed portfolios and such. But get, check it out, read about our security and our privacy, read about our, uh, on our About Us page. And yeah, if you're, if you're not an American and you're not uh, a resident of the United States, then it's a, a great opportunity. We can get an account opened up for you and we'll be glad to bring you on board and help shore up some of your, your finances and, and your, you know, help you secure some wealth. All right, great, Ash. Uh, really, uh, uh, thanks for uh, agreeing to do this and bearing with me on my first uh, borderless video here. Yeah, I'll see, you in, I'll see you in Panama sometime soon, right, James? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. So uh, if, you, if you enjoyed this video, if you could just uh, like the video and uh, subscribe below. Hopefully we'll have some more that uh, you find interesting. I'll be coming out with, with new ones with uh, different people. So uh, please follow me or you can go to borderlessblog.com and uh, follow me there. So thanks for watching and I'll, I'll talk to you soon.